Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about a bizarre controversy that happened at the 1999 Las Vegas Bowl involving BYU. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. Hi everybody, I'm Vin Scully and welcome to Game 6. Saturday, October 25th, 1986. What's about to transpire on this day at Shea Stadium between the Boston Red Sox and the New York Mets will go down in history as one of the greatest moments, as one of the greatest games in the history of baseball, and even the history of American sports. The Mets have their backs against the wall. They're down 3-2 in the World Series, and if they don't win this game, then the Boston Red Sox, for the first time since 1918, win the title, breaking a near 70-year drought. At no point in this game did the Mets ever hold down the lead, as the Mets were constantly playing catch-up. They were down 2-0 after 2 innings, and tied it in the 5th. They were down 3-2 after 7 innings, and tied it in the 8th. Time after time during this game, the Mets answered the call, and responded with whatever the Red Sox threw their way. But then, the 10th inning happened, and the Red Sox, thanks to a home run down the left field line by Dave Henderson, and a single by Marty Bennett to drive in Wade Boggs, led it 5-3. At this point, the Red Sox were up by two runs, and they were three outs away from winning the World Series and finally ending the curse of the Bambino. And in the bottom of the 10th, the outcome of this contest was all but a formality. After two fly balls for the first two batters, with Wally Backman flying out to left and Keith Hernandez flying out to center, the Mets were down by two runs and were down to their final out. Thanks to win probability analytics, with one out to go in the 10th, the Red Sox odds of winning this game sat at a whopping 99%. The World Series was theirs. There was no way they could possibly blow it, right? Line into left field, base hit for Carter, and the Mets are still alive. Third ball, and that's going to be hit to center, base hit. And now suddenly with two out in the 10th inning, and that's going to be hit into center field, base hit. Here comes Carter to score, and the time run is at third in Kevin Mitchell. And it's going to go to the backstop. Here comes Mitchell to score the tying run, and Ray Knight is at second base. Little roller up along first, behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. Ball game. Out of nowhere, the Mets just pulled off one of the greatest and most miraculous comebacks in the history of American sports, winning it 6-5, with Mookie Wilson's final at-bat, with the ball infamously going through Bill Buckner's legs, still living on all these years later. Just like that, the World Series was tied at three apiece. And it meant that on Sunday night, October 26th, the whole sports world will be focused on Shea Stadium for a winner-take-all Game 7. Game 7, the two greatest words in sports. Keep in mind that by this point, even though football had overtaken baseball in popularity, the World Series was still a huge deal, to the point where the NFL wouldn't dare compete against it. There was nothing else happening that night. It was estimated that anywhere from 55 to 60 million people would be tuned in to watch the thrilling conclusion to the season. Nothing would be able to stop the World Series. That is, nothing except for a little bit of weather. Because as it turned out, we'd have to wait one more day for Game 7 to be played, and we'd have to wait one more day for baseball to crown a champion. It was not an easy decision in the slightest bit to make, for a variety of reasons. However, the last thing anyone wanted was for the weather and for the poor field conditions to determine the outcome, especially since this was one of the biggest games in the history of the sport. When the commissioner of baseball stepped on the field, alongside some of the umpires, he said that the field was too soggy from all the rain, and the forecast, which called for showers throughout the night, but called for good weather on Monday, decided that it was in the best interest of everyone involved if the game got moved back 24 hours. As he said, this series does not deserve to be played under these conditions. And what this meant was that instead of airing on Sunday night, 
and going up against TV movies and random cable programming, it was now airing on Monday night and going directly up against the juggernaut on ABC known as Monday Night Football. Now, the fact that the World Series and Monday Night Football were competing against each other by itself wasn't a huge deal. Everyone knew that Game 7 was going to win in the ratings. Asking whether the final game of the World Series would have better ratings than the random regular season Monday Night game was like asking whether you would think a Taylor Swift concert or a concert by the garage band that those kids from high school play in would sell more tickets. You know the answer. It's incredibly obvious. And if this game was a game between two unaffiliated teams, like the Seattle Seahawks and the San Diego Chargers, or the Dallas Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers, then this is a complete non-story. Except, it wasn't. Because on October 27, 1986, the same night as Game 7 of the World Series, just 18 miles away, across the Hudson River, the New York Giants would be playing and would be taking on Washington in an absolutely critical NFC East battle. On paper, as we hit the halfway point, this was the biggest game of the entire NFL season thus far. Washington entered at 6-1, having jumped out to a hot start at 5-0, and, oh, and looking like they were showing no signs of slowing down, thanks to the solid play of Pro Bowl quarterback Jay Schrader, the absolutely powerful running of George Rogers, and the suffocating pressure on the defensive line forced by Dexter Manley. And New York entered at 5-2, thanks to the best defense in football, as the Giants only allowed a league-best 90 points through 7 games, allowing an average of just 12.8 points per game. They too had weapons, like quarterback Phil Simms, who was looking like he was playing the best football of his career, running back Joe Morris, who was nothing short of a touchdown scoring machine, tight end Mark Bavaro, who had a claim for being the best tight end in the NFL, and the incomparable Lawrence Taylor, who needs no introduction, as he was not only the best pass rusher in football, but he was already in the discussion for the greatest defender of all time. This game was huge, and in a normal world, this game would have had massive ratings, and would have had Giant Stadium rocking for all the right reasons. But this was not a normal world. This was a world where this incredible game was going up against Game 7 of the World Series, with Game 7 involving the hometown team. Because let's get one thing straight. I don't know a single person who was a Giants fan who would have been rooting for the Red Sox to win this game. If you were a Giants fan that cared about baseball, you were rooting for the Mets, no questions asked. Either you were a Mets fan and were rooting for your team to win for obvious reasons, or you were a Yankees fan and would be caught dead before you'd be caught rooting for the Red Sox to win at all especially since it was tough to have a lot of animosity towards the Mets back then, seeing as interleague play wasn't a thing, so the Yankees and Mets had never played each other. For one reason or another, if you were a sports fan in New York, even though this Giants game was important, it was the last thing on your mind. You were focused on Game 7 of the World Series, which, much like the Giants game, was taking place in your own backyard. And this set up one of the craziest, and most bizarre moments in the history of Monday Night Football and in the history of the NFL. Because it set up a crazy conflict where the football game was completely overshadowed by the World Series by literally everyone in attendance at the game itself. And it set up a moment that more than three and a half decades later still lives on in history. Because this is the story behind the craziest conflict between the NFL and the World Series of all time. Hello again, everyone. I'm Frank Gifford. Welcome to Giant Stadium, where there are 76,000 expected tonight. Another Giant sellout. We think they'll all be here, even though there is a little happening going on a few miles away from here. But I guess you could call it great alternative viewing, because what you have tonight is two longtime rivals fighting for a share, or for the Giants at least a share of first place in the NFC Eastern Division. Now, this video was inspired entirely by what's happening at the World Series right now. The Philadelphia Phillies are playing the Houston Astros, and the original plan, barring no weather problems, was to have Game 5 of the series take place on Wednesday, November 2nd, with the two teams having an off day on November 3rd to travel back to Houston for a possible Game 6 and Game 7. Nowadays, the NFL is king, and MLB will try and do everything in their power 
to avoid having their championship games go up against the NFL, intentionally making it so that the off days for travel were on Sunday and Thursday, days traditionally occupied by football. Good idea in theory. However, even the best laid plans of mice and men go awry. And when Mother Nature had other ideas, and inclement weather forced Game 3 to get postponed, it meant that Game 5 was now taking place on Thursday, November 3rd, competing directly against the NFL. But they're not just competing against the NFL. They're competing against the game between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Houston Texans, forcing both Philly and Houston sports fans to choose between one or the other. The fact that it worked out this way, where the same two markets are playing an NFL and an MLB game at the same exact time, was pure coincidence, and is something that we might not see happen again for a very long time, if ever again. However, let's compare this to what happened in 1986, just to understand the significance and the magnitude of it. Number one, what's happening this year is Game 5 of the World Series. Yes, Game 5 is important, and no one's denying that. Traditionally, teams that go up 3-2 in a playoff series go on and win the series 75% of the time. You go up 3-2, and you force your opponent to play perfect, with no room for error the rest of the way, or else their season is done. However, it's not a clinching game. Neither the Phillies nor the Astros can win the World Series tonight in Game 5. Compare that to Game 7, where the winner takes it all, and the loser walks away empty-handed for good, and it's like night and day. Number 2. The NFL game in 1986 was a big game between two teams that absolutely despised each other. New York and Washington were two division rivals, with a winner taking first place at a time where winning the division meant a first round bye, and not winning the division meant a wild card spot at best. There was no love lost between these two teams, especially after the infamous Monday Night Football moment from a few years before, where Joe Theismann's leg snapped in half and his career ended. But the game taking place between the Eagles and the Texans? Come on. Even with the loss, the Eagles are still in first in their division, and are a lock to make the playoffs. And for all intents and purposes, the Texans' season is over. They're 1-5-1, and, and barring a couple of meteor strikes, they're not going anywhere this season. Plus, the Eagles and Texans do not have a rivalry in the slightest bit. Show me an Eagles fan that despises the Texans on the same level that they despise the Cowboys, and I'll show you a crazy person. The stakes for both the NFL and the MLB game are significantly less this year than they were in 1986. But number three has to deal with the technology of 1986 compared to the technology available today. I'm sure a ton of fans in both Philadelphia and Houston are going to utilize some sort of split-screen technology where they might have two TVs and have each game on one of them, or they'll watch one game on their phone or computer, and the other game on their TV. That did not exist back in 1986. Unless you were at a sports bar, or you were an absolute god at flipping back and forth between NBC and ABC and could time it perfectly, it was pick one or the other. And if you did want to pick both, it was going to look incredibly awkward. To the point where at Giants Stadium on that night, according to Les Unger, the publicist for the Meadowlands Sports Complex, 5,000 fans brought portable TV sets into the venue, meaning that of the 75,923 fans to be in their seats for this Monday Night Football game, roughly 7% of them were watching their own TV, and were only going to turn their attention to the Giants game when there was a break in the action in baseball, or when the baseball game ended, since the game started at 8 o'clock, and the Monday Night Football game started at 9 o'clock. The New York Times reported that in Section 331, which holds somewhere in the ballpark of a thousand seats, there were at minimum 35 portable TV sets, and that was on the lower end for sections throughout Giants Stadium. And that's assuming that there's one person to a TV. In all likelihood, that was not the case. And besides the 5,000 people who brought TVs, you had a bunch of others who brought radios. In other words, it might have been the first and only time in NFL history that you had a sellout crowd that wasn't there for the game and was there for a completely different game in a completely different sport. The Giants game was just background noise to them. 
And this led to some incredibly bizarre moments that might never be replicated again. Take this play for instance. It's the second quarter, and Washington has the ball at the 45-yard line. On this play, Jay Schrader hits Gary Clark on a 50-yard pass to get Washington in a goal-to-go situation. And even though it happened against the Giants, the crowd goes nuts. Not because it was infiltrated with Washington fans who did a visitor's takeover of the stadium, but because at the same exact time, the Mets scored on a base hit by Keith Hernandez in the bottom of the sixth inning to cut the deficit to 3-2. Take a listen. Crowd is responding to what's happening at Shea. And they're reacting to the Mets as Schrader goes deep for Clark, and Clark makes the catch. Later in the drive, Washington committed a false start penalty on the goal line, with tight end Clint Didier moving early. The play backed them up five yards, and forced them to settle for a 23-yard field goal by Max and Dejas. Didier moved early because the crowd noise was deafening. Not because the Giants fans were cheering their own team, but because they were cheering a ground ball by Gary Carter that drove in Wally Backman and tied the game up at three apiece. As guard Russ Grimm said, The noise hurt us. It pulled us off sides a couple of times. Head coach Joe Gibbs echoed those thoughts, especially on that big false star penalty, saying, The crowd caused us to jump off side, and it cost us a touchdown. That was a big play. It was the greatest home field advantage in Giants history, and it was by complete accident. Many Giants fans had no idea that they just helped their team save four points. And that wasn't the only time that the Giants fans inadvertently helped their team out. Take this play later in the second quarter. Over at Shea Stadium, it was the bottom of the seventh inning, and Ray Knight hit a home run into left center field to give the Mets their first lead of the day, making it 4-3, and increasing their win probability from 12% at the start of the bottom of the sixth inning to 80%. And the crowd noise was so out of nowhere and so deafening that it forced tackle Joe Jacoby, one of the best and most disciplined tackles in football, to move early and be called for a false start penalty. Uh-oh. The Mets have just taken the lead on a home run. There uh, must be thousands of television sets here at Giant Stadium. And that's the reason for the crowd screaming as they are right now. And in fact, Seaman dropping the flag and the Redskins and the Giants were so startled <laughs> by the crowd reaction to what was going on, it had an effect on what was taking place here. The crowd was cheering at the strangest of times, to the point where the players were split into two camps. On one hand, you had the players that had no idea what was happening in baseball, had no idea that the Mets were in the World Series and were playing that night, and were extremely confused as to what was going on, seeing as they had never heard anything like this before. Again, if you just listen to the crowd, you would think that they knew nothing about football whatsoever with how they were cheering. On the New York side, linebacker Lawrence Taylor said, It was wild. Really weird. One time, I made a good tackle. I got a standing ovation. I was feeling really good until my teammate, Harry Carson, told me they were cheering the baseball game. On the Washington side, linebacker Neil Olkowitz said, For a while, we didn't understand what the noise was all about. We finally figured it out. They were making noise for the World Series. On the other hand, you had the players that knew exactly what was happening and knew that Giants fans were there that couldn't be bothered with the Giants and were messing everything up by cheering at the wrong times and being loud while the Giants were on offense and quiet while they were on defense. And they didn't like it one bit. Quarterback Phil Sims bashed the fans, saying, It was like we were in Seattle again. I was beginning to hate the Mets. I heard them. I got a little upset. I knew they weren't cheering us. Offensive lineman Brad Benson was more blunt, saying, I really thought the fans should have gone to the baseball game. I'm not joking. It really was a distraction. It really got me upset. He then continued, saying, It disconcerted us. They should have gone to the baseball game if they were that concerned. Last week in Seattle, when we were playing the Seahawks, the crowd was yelling at us so loud, we couldn't hear the signals, and our own crowd was more interested in baseball. I guess playing Washington on a Monday night is pretty mundane compared to a baseball game. 
And offensive tackle Carl Nelson was a bit more sympathetic, but was still disappointed and angry, saying, I was a little irritated by it, but it was the seventh game of the World Series, and I kind of understand it, but I definitely wasn't the happiest guy out there. However, the random cheers did not last forever, because eventually, Game 7 of the World Series came to a close on this play right here, when, with the Mets leading 8-5, Marty Barrett struck out swinging. Just like that, the 1986 MLB season was over, and the New York Mets, for just the second time ever, and for the first time since 1969, were world champions. The curse of the Bambino lived on, and every baseball fan in New York rejoiced, whether you were a Mets fan who waited for this moment for your whole life, or whether you were a Yankees fan and just despised the Red Sox. And here's how the moment sounded 18 miles away at Giant Stadium, when everyone found out that the Mets were the new world champions of baseball. And the Mets just won the World Series, so that's the reason for the response. And that'll create a little bit of a delay here while the crowd settles down. It yeah, will. And it'll delay things considerably for the next few days in New York. It was a crazy celebration. The football game was still going on, and people were tearing up their game programs in the stands, and using them as confetti to throw in an impromptu celebration. And eventually, when the fans did stop cheering for the Mets, and started focusing on the Giants again, they were treated to an incredible game, that even though no one watched it, seeing as it was the lowest rated Monday Night Football game of all time at the time, drawing an 8.8 .8 rating, was really, really fun to watch. The Giants blew a 20-3 lead, but won it on a late touchdown run by Joe Morris to win it 27-20, making this a perfect night in New York. If you were a Mets and Giants fan, even though that combination is pretty unusual speaking from experience, that night was like heaven on earth. You saw your football team jump into first place by defeating their arch rival, and you saw your baseball team win the World Series. Because of how technology works nowadays, and because of just how much of a stranglehold the NFL has on sports, where it's the only sport immune from a ratings decrease and a popularity decrease, something like this will never happen again. This moment on October 27, 1986, was the true definition of a once-in-a-lifetime moment, and was a time capsule in American sports history. It required the perfect storm of events that no one thought was possible. Because on this night in 1986, even if you were at the actual game, the answer to the question, are you ready for some football, was quite simply, not yet. Not until the Mets finish playing. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.